This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you again by our sponsor, the Magic Bookshop.com. You ought to go and check them out because they get new arrivals each week of old and out-of-print books. And if you're looking for some rare find that you can't find anyplace else, you might want to go check them out. While you're there, of course, they have the newest as well. Also, I want to uh, welcome the newest friend of the Magic Word, that's Mr. Chris Shepard. Thank you, Chris, very much for your pledge to the MagicWordPodcast.com. That means so much to me, and I appreciate your pledge and those of every other friend of the Magic Word who have pledged or donated, made a one-time donation or a monthly pledge. That's all appreciated, but never more than just now. I mean, I understand that everything is pretty tough, of course, and everybody is trying to scramble for every little bit that they can get and finding different ways of course of doing it. And so I was surprised whenever that you had elected to make that pledge and it, it uh, certainly means a lot. And I know I'm, it's, I haven't been asking for that during this difficult time right now while everyone is kind of sheltered in place and uh, a lot of people are worried about where their income is going to be coming from tomorrow. And so again, I, I certainly do appreciate it. And so I again want to uh, thank you uh, and the rest of the Friends of the Magic Word and the sponsor for helping to keep this podcast going. Well, this week we're going to get to speak with somebody who has been touring with the Illusionist. And when they came through Houston a few weeks ago, I didn't realize that that was perhaps one of the last of their shows. I don't know how many more that they actually went on before they finally shut down the uh, the touring show, as all the rest of the shows have been shut down then as well. But uh, I spoke with Martin Cox, who was from the UK, and he had been a guest of mine for a couple of nights while he was passing through doing a lecture tour here recently. And he had suggested that I talk with his good friend, Jonathan Goodwin, who is an escape artist. Now, I haven't really had an opportunity to sit down and talk at length with an escape artist. I've spoken with Spencer Horseman a time or two on the podcast, just in some convention reports, uh, but I really haven't chatted with him at length. And it's not just the the uh, escapes that are of the ordinary type, and I say ordinary where you're doing a water torture or a straitjacket escape, etc. But I like where, uh, where Jonathan's going with this and the idea where that he's trying to figure out what it is that the audience needs. What are they looking looking for and what do they actually believe uh, and how much jeopardy can one get into that would be permissible and also I guess what is he willing to uh, what level of risk is he willing to accept there are a lot of really interesting uh, things he's talking about here that I've never discussed with anybody because I've never <laughs> met anybody who is quite like this uh, who has this kind of a background and this experience and the stories he tells well you're going to hear some good ones from Mr. Goodwin <laughs> see what I did there Please welcome my guest this week, Mr. Jonathan Goodwin, here on The Magic Word. Well, today we are going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, a few weeks ago, I spoke with uh, Jamie Allen uh, from the UK, who is an illusionist, and I don't often, as I mentioned then, I don't often get an opportunity to speak with people who are illusionists. Most people I talk with, it seems like, are close-up guys or mentalists or something, you know, and so uh, we've got another opportunity to speak with someone who is a stage performer, and not only that, he is uh, well-known uh, throughout the UK and uh, and in the US, has been uh, performing here uh, with uh, part of the group as, with the illusionists, doing a nationwide wide tour and uh, he is someone who has been on a lot of television shows star of stage and screen so he has performed in in his own series uh, a couple things we'll be probably talking about uh, while he was in the UK and also it's kind of interesting I think that he is in a has unique status that within one year that he had performed not only in the West End in London but also in Broadway uh, in New York City within the same year which is kind of impressive <laughs> that everybody gets to do either one of those let alone you know in the same year and everything then too and i would hope that if you have not seen him on youtube or on any of the got talent shows that you will go and take a look i'm going to post a couple of those on the website at the magic or podcast.com so you can get a chance to uh see some of his act and of course then to uh, visit his website but uh, we'll get into that a little bit but it's uh, a new friend of mine someone that I'd met through uh, Martin Cox a mutual friend of ours so please welcome Jonathan Goodwin hey Jonathan 
How are you? <laughs> I'm fantastic. Thank you very much for your time here this afternoon. Oh, it's a pleasure. So you're with The Illusionist, um, my first question really is who, who else is in the tour? I know The Illusionist kind of swaps out different people. It does. I've done this tour actually for a while, um, probably close to five or six years now I've been, I've been touring with The Illusionists. And, uh, and it changes a lot. Um, so right now in the show, we have uh, David Williamson, who everybody I'm sure will know. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a British mind reader called Chris Cox. He's very good, very entertaining. Uh, there is a Korean sleight of hand guy called Hyun Jun Kim and uh, a French illusionist uh, who is kind of pretty new on the scene. His name is Valentin Azima. He's also very charismatic and, and really good too. So uh, it's just the, the five of us and uh, it's a really fun show. Yeah. You get a mixed bag. Every time, every time we throw one of these things together, different personalities and different things mm-hmm. sort of uh, collide. And this one's really lovely. Everybody's, everybody's very sweet. And how is that, uh, it, traveling with everybody? I mean, you have to kind of, when you're thrown in together to begin with, kind of in this soup, and you're trying to <laughs> make it taste right, you know, that it, it, who produces this to make sure, I guess, that they have the right mix of people or different talent? So there's a, a, a company um, that have produced the show since, I think it started in 2012, if I, if I, um, I think I have that right, uh, before I was involved in, in the production. Mm-hmm. And um, it's... Uh, well, that would have been back when Jeff Popson uh, and Kevin James were involved. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff was in at the beginning, um, Kevin was in... Um, and, and there were, I think Dan Sperry was, yep. was one of the original performers. It was a very different show. It, originally it toured with a, a live band. Uh, when I came, oh, didn't know that. when I came in, there was, that was, it was, it was sort of maybe the last year that, that, uh, that they had the band. Um, and I worked with all of those guys. Uh, they're all, they're all good friends. Um, but you know, as these things go on, you know, people go off and do other other projects, and um, and it's a very successful entity, and so there's no sort of shortage of people that want to kind of. I'm sure that's true. I mean, after they board. people see this, some illusionists or stage guys or mentalists might come over and say, "Hey, I can do that." You know, who can I talk to? You know, I want to kind of fill in. So you probably leave a trail of, of other magicians who are saying, "I want to do that." Yeah, hundred percent, and. Um, you know, it, it, over, over time, it's become more successful. The company uh, got bought out uh, last year oh. by Cirque du Soleil. Uh, oh, so, I didn't know that. So technically now we, we're a Cirque production. Okay. And um, How has that changed? It, it hasn't really changed very much at all. It's just actually. been for the management at top that yeah. – so you don't see it on the day-to-day as far as the production quality or – No, the, no. they put more money into it or – Not really, um, or, although it's, you know, it's all new. Like it's a, a very new, new endeavor, and I think that all of the changes that are happening on a managerial level are still ongoing. Mm-hmm. But from the point of view of, of what impact that has on the show – nothing really it, it's um you know i think they they bought a product that was successful and mm-hmm. i think it would be crazy for them to come in and right and change it and if you I got think a rolls were, royce then why should you try and change it into a vega you know exactly Chevy vega. and and you know i think there were people that that have been in the company for a while who were worried that you know we were all going to be forced to wear face paint and, mm. and that kind of thing <laughs> sure. but, but I, I don't think learn how to do acrobatics <laughs> the, the company's very successful and actually they they operate uh incredibly you know incredibly efficiently there are there are they have they don't just do magic shows they have circus shows and, and other things they and they they actually have almost as many tours current currently running as Cirque does and yet hmm. there's about 10 people in the office. And where's so the, where are they located? What's the head they're, office? They're, they're based in Los Angeles. Okay. And, uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons why Cirque was interested. They were like, how, how, how do you do this? You know? Yeah. So, which is ironic for a, for a magic company. But no, they're very successful. Um, they really know magic. They know how to put on a, a good show. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then obviously they understand that, that the, you know the the one thing that's different, I think, between between traditional circ shows and and our show is that it's personality led. You know, we we are we are what make the show show good, 
um, because the audience get to know us. And I think that's one of the important things about, you know, what, what makes magic uh, such an effective art form is that, and, and also I think it's really important from the point of view of, you know, if you're learning magic or getting into magic, that the key to making it successful is how do you make people care, mm -hmm. you know, above just doing a trick which is basically the same as, as someone. So what's your answer? What is your recommendation? How do you make people care? How do you create that brand? Well, there are lots of, there are lots of different ways of making people care. Um, I, I think that, that first and foremost, you sort of have to make it relatable. Mm -hmm. You know, people, there's a, uh, I have a friend in the UK, so, uh, someone that you guys may know, uh, called Jeffrey Durham. I, I know, yes. know Jeff, but he, he says, uh, in his lecture, nobody ever uh, nobody ever wanted to see a magic trick, but they might not mind watching someone they like do one. And I think that's really important, you know. Um, uh, so I think that's that's kind of an interesting thing, you know. How, I, especially with my stuff, because obviously I'm I'm not really a magician actually, although it is my background. Mm -hmm. um, I, you consider yourself an escapologist, I assume. Yeah, and a stunt performer. Um, I, I, but I was a magician for the longest time, and then once I started to get into escapes and stunts, I don't think they go together very well. Like I don't think you can flip back Separate and forth yeah. between doing magic tricks and 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 stunts and escapes because it undermines the stunts and escapes. If people think that hmm. it's a trick, it's a trick, sure. Then then I don't know where to what to believe anymore. So I I draw a line in the sand and I don't do that stuff anymore although I write and consult for other magic performers because I still have that sort of funny bone as it, as it were um, I understand that we know I used to uh, well do seances from time to time and the sure. guy that I was doing the seances with that we had like a mix and mingle beforehand and uh, when we first got started I was doing some magic during the mix and mingle and then we would do the seance and I felt that people believed that they were just tricks we were doing in the course of the seance so I changed my my close-up performance with that mix and mingle to be more of something that would be um, uh, macabre and bizarre, so it had a story to it, you know. So instead of just a, um, an invisible deck, you know, I would have like a little skeleton hand, you know, on it or something, and with a glorpy, you know, so that way the, in other words, you tell a story to kind of make it creepy a little bit, and, and something that people are not going to be laughing and applauding. It's like, huh, how'd that happen? So then you kind of prepare them for that, you know. So I think it's the same thing that if you are doing magic, it would take away from the uh, escapology because they would think, oh, if he's already done that, he must have this thing gimmick somehow or another also, you know. Sure. And I think that, um, you know, from my point of view, if you are asking people to care whether you live or die, they've got to like you, you know. Ah, and wow. So, that is, that's really interesting. You're uh, right. Uh, and so you, you uh, it has to be personality led. And, and hmm. if I'm doing something, hmm. you know, I, I do lots of very dangerous, stupid things. You know, I set myself on fire and I, I, you know, I've hung from helicopters and all, you know, all, all manner of different, different mm -hmm. things. Uh, and none of those things are relatable to most people. None of those things are, th uh, peop uh, uh, are things that people watching can go, oh, I know how that feels, mm. or I know I, I can I can see myself wanting to do that because why would nobody wants to do that? They anyway. may want to bungee jump, but that's about the extent it, of it, <laughs> exactly. And um, and so if I'm going to connect with an audience like that, I have to do it on a level that you know I have to find common ground. I have to find things that people can connect with me on mm -hmm. so that I can then take them to that place, if that makes sense. Let me ask you then, when you do television shows and you have a short snippet, let's say like British, Britain's, Britain's Got Talent, mm -hmm. you're just coming out and doing the trick, you know, doing the escape. Sure. It's hard to, and same thing with a mentalist, you know, to try to get people to understand and start to believe that you do have these powers to bend silverware, whatever it is. Uh, and when you've got 90 seconds or something, you know, it's it's a story, I guess, they tell beforehand to try to get people to be interested and to want to root for your success. Sure. That's that's the key, actually. Um, I'm, my background, aside from magic, is television. I wrote and produced a bunch of television shows, both in the UK and, mm -hmm. and in the States. And so um, it's a language that I'm very familiar with. And the the your story, your act in those shows 
begins the moment that you're on camera, which is actually maybe eight minutes or something, four, four or five minutes before you're actually on the stage doing mm -hmm. your performance. Actual performance, right. And so the the interviews and the B-roll and all of the the the, the, the sort of character um, material that they create uh, in order to introduce you to the audio, television audience, that's the beginning of the act. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's as it's important if you're ever going to do one of those shows it's as important to think about that stuff as it is about you know the, the act is in fact mm. it's in fact in many ways it's it's more important um because those shows are popularity contests huh that's a good point so they gotta love you from when the moment you walk on because they already kind of know you because of that little snippet that they have seen about you mm. which is a sizzle reel basically you're, you're talking about how to make a sizzle reel yeah and also um I think it's really important that that you know who you are, um, because how can you expect an audience to know if you don't? You know, like presenting what you do as a unified front, so that everything fits mm -hmm. and is thought about from the point of view of you know what you wear, the material that you've chosen, the angle that you want to take. And I'm talking specifically about those got talent shows that mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people that, that you know, and lo certainly lots and lots of people that are incredibly skilled, top of their field, and we, you have to create that interest. Like, wh why do I vote for this person versus that person? And most of the time, it's going to be either a taste thing, you know, I, and, and that's something that I fight at, actually, is that... I'm there's a there's a product in in the UK called Marmite which is mm -hmm. uh, I don't like no well that's the thing Marmite <laughs> their their tagline it's a, you put it on on toast or mm -hmm. bread or something in the morning and and it has a very distinctive flavor and their yeah. tagline is you either love it or you hate it and my genre is that to a lot of people because mm -hmm. some people love it and they love to be excited and they love the thrill of it and some people don't like to be scared and so, hmm. and I'm never going to win those people over. That's right. Which is when I would, when I did Britain's Got Talent, I never expected that I would, I never expected that I would go as far as I did. I was in, in the final of that show. Um, you finished your second, third? I, do you know what? I don't know. Um, it was all what, a blur? No, I don't know. They, uh, once you're in the final, I yeah. think I, they, I wasn't in the top two. And after the top two, you don't know where, oh, I see. where you came, if that I makes see. sense. Um, but uh, I was, bewildered that i was there and i'm very excited but um, how many times did you go before uh, perform to get to that point it's three performances three, okay. in the uk it's not as many as america mm. and um uh but the the winner of that show and and i i you know he, he was a charming guy but was a 90 year old war veteran mm -hmm. uh had a good story he had a great story he was a <laughs> singer I think probably he would admit he's not the world's best singer. Yeah. But, you know, the producers put him standing on a carpet of poppies and <laughs> and and there okay. were, you know, pictures of his fallen comrades behind him and, and members well. of the armed forces in the in the in the audience. I don't all. think Mother Teresa would fare any better. No, ex exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so um and of course he, he stormed it stormed it. Sure. He 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 won massively because like I said, those shows are popularity contests. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, you know, I think you have to go, if you're going to go do it, you have to go in with an agenda. And for me, it was about getting good footage, you know, of, of To of use that I footage do. to launch you into doing what? Well, just from the point of view of, of you know, if you have a unique act, if mm -hmm. you have something that is original and interesting and... And you know it's going to get you work. Um, the, you, in order to sell that, you have to have footage of it. But your work is unique from almost everybody I talk with. In the standpoint, I mean, you're not going to be doing something in an intimate environment. You're not going to be doing strolling. You're not going to be performing at a wedding. You know, no. you know things like this. And that your performances are stage performances or outdoors, oftentimes, uh, or whatever, in which you're going to be having a large group of people. Or you, you're, you're perfectly suited for the theater. You know that you're doing. Sure. Uh, so, I think that would be. 
uh, for many people, a hard nut to crack because there are not many people as successful as you are in doing what you're doing and the other illusionists in touring with this. There might be a stage show that they can do from time to time, but this is – it was difficult to get, I would think – from where you were to where you are, but you're telling me, as I hear you, that you're using the, that for footage to try to, to launch to get into this, basically. No, it, it not, it's not really about getting into it. It's just about, you know, ultimately, um, you know, what, uh, as much as I love what I do, it's a business. And, it is, exactly. And so, you know... You get treated more, like that. Yeah, and the more people that know what I do, um, the 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 better as far as I'm concerned. But did you have like a 5, 10, 15 year plan of like, okay, here's what I want to go, or no, just kind of let it fly wherever it lands? My career was backwards, actually. What do you mean? Because I got into television first hmm. Um, hmm. as a performer. I Magic. Yeah, but also this stuff okay. too. Okay, okay. Um, I, so to give you the sort of, the the quick version of it, I, I uh, grew up in Pembrokeshire, Southwest Wales, I had a, a a mentor who taught me magic, and he was a, a an elderly guy who wanted to pass on everything that he knew, you know. Mm-hmm. And and he had a pretty good broad knowledge of 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 magic generally. Um, and so that was a very, you know, it was an interesting process, and that was like a ten year relationship mm. for me until he passed away, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, then there was a period of time when I wanted to be an actor, and so I went and did a degree in theatre um, uh, uh, in, in London and was doing sort of close-up gigs and things like that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, at the same time. And one of those close-up gigs took me to Bristol, and uh, which is a, a city... Mm-hmm. Near uh, Bath. Near Bath in, yeah, in, in, in the UK, where I met uh, Darren Brown, Mm-hmm. Um, because he lived there at the time and had just made his very first TV special. And we became friends. I would go and hang out with him. He's a very nice guy. Yeah, he's lovely um, and obnoxiously talented. Why is he? Uh, and, um, and creative. And yeah. He surrounds himself with like people, you know, yeah. creative. and Yeah. He, uh, um, the, 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 the group of people that were responsible for making that show are uh, really, truly amazing. Um and and I was fortunate enough to to sort of get into that world and into, oh, wow. that, into that mix through my friendship with Darren. He lived with me for a while mm-hmm. in London, and then um, and then I, I got the opportunity through that connection to to try out for a TV show that they were making, which was a magic show. And so I made that show, and I wrote a, a whole bunch of it as well. Um, I seems to have a pretty natural sort of talent for coming up with with ideas that worked for television for script screenwriting yeah, yeah. script and and also just the high concepts of of what would be a fun version of, ah, okay. of this how do we how do we you know how do we make this work for tv you know I, it was just something that, that mm-hmm. i was naturally good at and um and so i did that i made three seasons of that show what was the name of the show? It, that show was called Monkey Magic. Okay, um, and I remember hearing about that. Yeah, we did we did a bunch of those, and then it was and, a team of guys, right? Yeah, it was me and three other guys. Yeah, and um, and then I they asked me, the production company asked me to start working behind the camera as a consultant and producer and writer for some of the other shows because they started to make a lot of shows, and I worked on Darren as well. I wrote and mm-hmm. and, and and was a consultant for him and. They made a lot of magic. Um, the The owners of of the companies uh, is a guy called Andrew O'Connor, and his business partner Michael Vine were both magicians, and so they had a real idea for for how they could present magic well on television. And was were, Michael Vine related to Tim Vine? No. Okay, no, never mind. Then. They're, they're not related. Um, uh, they. Um, yeah, they were hugely successful at it, and and you know they did other things, game shows and and sitcom shows and and whatnot, and um, and so that was kind of how I got into it. And then they made a, a, a an escape artist special with uh, with an American escape artist, and it was the one show that they made where I feel like the producers didn't quite get it right. Uh, and the, the escape artist is very talented, very skilled guy. Mm-hmm. 
but the show wasn't very good. They tried to present it like a David Blaine special, like okay. a, a mysterious thing. And I just had a very knee-jerk reaction to it, and I emailed the exec, uh, Andrew, and I told him that I thought his show was bad uh, as a you know cocky 21-year-old or whatever. <laughs> and um, rather than tell me, you know, where to go he uh he said well film something and and put your money where your mouth is then so i did and i filmed the thing it's my my philosophy about about escapes which has sort of morphed a little bit over time but my reaction was that the reason that i wanted to do it was because i didn't like it you know because i thought it was bad Hmm. and i was like i think i could do better um, based upon what you had seen other people perform on based television, upon, based upon based upon an escapology, generally, like okay. I, I really didn't like most of it, hmm. and and the reason there it was like a manifesto that I created for myself, probably in about thirty seconds, which is <laughs> that what's wrong with it is that um, the jeopardy is always death, mm-hmm. which is unrealistic, um, and. Uh, the, you they always escape and just in the nick of time mm-hmm. and most of the time the restraints are things that mean nothing to the general public at all mm, good um, point yeah like they don't use straight jackets anymore that kind of a thing it, it, yeah. exactly like in fact the straight jacket is a perfect example because it has become the opposite of what it was mm-hmm. now the only time the public come into contact with a straitjacket is when they see someone taking it off, and usually like a sweater. Yeah. And so, it not only do they do they you know know it's escapable, they know that that it, that's imminently what it is. Right. Um. Uh. And so, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do it for real. I won't make the jeopardy death. If I fail, that's valid too, as theatrically. If you know, if I don't succeed. And, um, and but I'll, you're not going to die. I'm not going to die because it's. So it, I used to think, what's the worst thing that I would be willing to have happen to me mm-hmm. in a worst case scenario, and then work backwards from that. So the very first yeah. thing that I did was I, uh, and, and I, I wanted to make it very gritty and real. I was really quite influenced by Jackass at the time, the the, the Jackass TV show. Yeah, I remember that. So I did. Uh, I filmed the thing. It was very homemade intentionally. Uh, and I, I actually roped my dad into being sort of my my foil uh, in it, and so I uh, I was tied shirtless to a bed, um, and we put a bed sheet above me, uh, stretched tied to the four corners okay. of the bed above me, like you know two feet above me, and then Dad got a hot iron and put it onto the sheet, so I had to escape before the iron Went fell through, through and the- hit, hit me in the chest. Yeah. It's like a, a like a homemade version of of Table of Death, basically. Mm-hmm. Huh, that's um, interesting. And and I didn't succeed, and the iron burned through, and it did hit me in the chest. And for a while, I had a, an scar. iron shaped oh, scar <laughs> scar on my wow. chest. Wow, what a and, story! And I and I, <laughs> but I sent that footage to the producer and of Jackass. He, no, for the, of the the producer of the of of the other escape show, the, the guy that okay. said, "Put your money where your mouth is." And he was like, okay, I get it. And so he was making a television show in the UK that was like a magazine studio-based show. And he gave me a spot in that every week. And and so I made about six of those like little mini homemade Did you come to them escapes. with an outline of here, so I'm gonna, here are the six escapes? Or did you just figure out from week to week? Or what, was it all shot no, in one it was, time? It no, was, it was all shot pr- you know, probably over the Within course of about, of about two Ten or days. three weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then also I was involved as a producer in the other elements of the show. I was, I was, um, wearing many hats at that time. Um, so I made that and then my little section was probably the most successful part of that show. And so then they gave me a special, um, my own thing, which was, um, I made a show, a special called the seven stupidest things to escape from, (laughs) which Um, included what? Oh did you goodness. remember off the top of your head? Uh, I did an escape where I was glued to a tree and tied to a dog. Um, <laughs> uh, I I did an escape. 
So that was the thing. So I wanted to make the Jeopardies. They can, they can be, doesn't have to be, to be death. And it certainly doesn't have to be, you know, injury. It could be humiliation. So we did an escape where we went to an office building. And I t- had told a bunch of my family and friends that there was a surprise party for me. Mm-hmm. And so they were going to surprise me standing at the uh, outside a, a, an elevator door in, in the sort of oh. the lobby of this office building, which we'd kind of hired. So they're all standing there at the bottom of the elevator. And meanwhile, myself and my dad are 15 floors up. Mm-hmm. And I get tied naked to a, a cart, like a dolly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and put into the elevator with my clothes. <laughs> okay, and wow, then, I see where you're going. And then Dad presses the button for the ground floor. So I had the time it, it took to escape. Uh, Was there a camera in the... Oh, yeah, okay. the cameras everywhere. Yeah. Um, the time it took for the... For the um, to, to, to escape Escaped. and put my clothes on before we hit the ground floor. With all your friends? Yeah. Um, and? <laughs> I got one hand out. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was uh it was i mean it was very entertaining and kind of you know i'm sure whatever happened it would have been funny and good sure but um that was it was you know from the point of view of of imp- impact on tv it was probably the best case scenario <laughs> so yeah so we you know we did a bunch of those things i i did a, a, a stunt which actually didn't make it for numerous different reasons but i i was sewn up inside a dead cow um as part of that i'd read about that yeah and that must have smelled horrible it was fresh. It was actually just oh. like being, you know, in a butcher shop. It was, okay. It was. Um, they gutted it and yeah. made room, and they sewed you up in it. And then I escaped through its back passage. Yeah. Okay. Um, ah. Okay. It wow. was actually very difficult. It was. I was restrained in it as well, so I had to escape from my restraints, then then get out. And um, through the bowels of the cow. Yeah, it was very heavy. Couldn't really breathe, and uh, dark. Yeah, very dark. It took me probably about forty-five minutes to to get out. Wait, um, was it just in a cow pasture, or where did they? It was in it was in a, a farmyard. Yeah. yeah. Um, Goodness sakes! <laughs> uh, before I forget, it, you had talked about your dad being involved with something. Yeah. I remember when I'd completely forgotten the story until you just mentioned that. That my older son at the time was probably about, I think maybe nine, eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there, and he wanted to be an escape biologist, I guess. Sure. And so he would have me put uh, my jacket on him, you know, and zip it up the uh, backwards, oh, right. you know. Uh, and then he would, you know, tie the arms uh, together, basically, so his arms in front, then zip it up. I mean, it was like a parka, you know, uh-huh. basically. And put him in the closet, you know, and close the closet so it'd be dark and everything, and he'd have to try to get out of the, of, out of the jacket. And I remember talking to my wife at the time and thinking, you know, I hope we don't have a fire or something, you know, or somebody comes in just about the time he comes out of the closet, you know, <laughs> you know, sweating, <laughs> yeah. getting out of this. Like, what are you doing to your kid over oh, here? Sure. And he said, do it again, Dad. Do it again. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had exactly the same relationship with my dad. It was almost like, um, uh, you know, fr- free babysitting for him because, <laughs> you know, he would tie me up, put me, you know, tie me to the, the you know, the kitchen table or you know whatever it was yeah and um until i got until i got good at it they always knew where i was you know <laughs> well he, similar with a babysitter talking about i forgot about this also that i remember getting a phone call from the babysitter one time saying where are the keys to the handcuffs you know <laughs> because i i think that he she had you know he convinced her to put him in handcuffs and do something you know yeah. and he wasn't getting out of them and so uh you know they called us and said oh well <laughs> hey he hasn't really you didn't continue that path right you're perhaps a bit relieved about that <laughs> in a way yeah. that's right that's right uh so did your dad uh, continue to kind of tour with you travel with you now or no no i we, i did so after the seven stupidest things we made a show called death wish um live so it was that was two live specials that i made in the same week mm-hmm. um and the the first special i was hanged live on television and i heard that you had that didn't go really according to no i did not intend to be hanged that was yeah. it wasn't i mean i we had done all of the the sort of math requirements to know that it would be okay mm-hmm. um, but it was a real thing and um yeah i did not get out i dropped the shim that I was using to open the cuffs. So at that point, there was nothing I could do. I just had to wait for it to happen. 
uh, it was very painful. And you had rope burns for a long time. A long time, yeah. Ouch. And then um, I the, the on the that was on the Monday of the week, and the Friday of the week we we did buried alive. And I guess you know the my work plays with people's fears and and their phobias you know? mm-hmm. and everybody has a different thing Everybody's like you've done like with the scorpions in the mouth and that kind of a thing exactly okay and um and the nail in the eye <laughs> i saw that picture it's like what the hell is that <laughs> going on there <laughs> um and and everybody's different and f- for my dad it was buried alive like that was the thing he was like because my dad was a cop and a fireman, so oh. he's he's kind of a a, a pretty clued in guy, and, mm-hmm. and he knows danger. He knows danger pretty well, and usually after I would explain to him what I was about to do, he, he you know the cameras would stop for a minute, and he he'd go, "Okay, I get this. Have you thought about this? Have you?" Thought? He would like you know mm-hmm. double check all of the safety thinking and everything, but most of the time he'd be like, "Yeah, okay, I get that. I would mm-hmm. you know I would do that, or I would have done that." Right. Buried is the one thing he was like, "No way, wouldn't do that." It's huh. like freaky. He's out. He was out. And then to, you know, it, it became a bit perverse to have to like, for him to stand there and watch me do that. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was that. Yeah. That's my son. He's, yeah. yeah, exactly. He didn't want to play anymore. Okay. Makes um, sense. I, ironically buried is, is something that I've done many times and now actually a version of it. I'm, I'm doing on stage. It in on stage, which I'm quite proud of. Cause I think it's the first time anybody's done buried on stage. No, I don't um, I can't, the only thing I can think of might be close to that would be, um, what was that? Todd Robbins had a, a thing in New York City, uh, Play Dead, I think, oh, yeah. and they had someone buried, oh, really? you know, that uh, supposedly that he would kill somebody with a shovel and buried him. I, I, anyhow, it was, uh, Teller had helped work on this, so yeah. it, was, it was interesting. Uh, well, speaking of, uh, of that and Buried Alive kind of a thing, how would you differentiate what you do from what David... Blaine might do. In other words, I, I, th- I think of David Blaine as kind of being uh, um, a performance artist from the mm-hmm. standpoint that it's not so much he's trying to get out of something, but he's doing something that's an endurance test. Sure. So that's a little bit different from trying to get out within a period of time, opposite of what you're doing, I guess, actually. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan. I think he's amazing. I yeah, think, he is. I think that um, some of his things, I think, are a bit confused. Um, but at the same like when time, he's standing on the pole, I never quite got that. Yeah, I, I, not actually, not so much that one. I mean, I, I, it was just a, an iconic image, and if you've ever stood on a chair for <laughs> any length of time, you know, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Good point. Um, it, 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 the, the, the one that really I didn't quite understand was the thing where he was in the ball underwater because he was trying, he was handcuffed and, um, and it was an escape stunt, but at the same time he was trying to break the record for holding Endurance. his breath uh-huh. underwater. So he was trying to get out and stay in at mm-hmm. the same time, and that didn't make sense to me. Ah, get um, out and stay in. Huh? Uh, you know, those 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 things are pulling in op- opposite directions. Now I know I know a lot of the people that work with with him, um, mm-hmm. and I. Th- I have a feeling that might have been, I don't know this for sure, but I, I have heard that it was a, a TV producer's requirement ah. that they were like, we've got to make this more about more than just holding your breath. Cause I think that's what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the nature of television is that, you know, a lot of the time it's a, it's a very, you know, collaborative process and you can have thought about something for years and then, you know, some TV executive, comes in and has thinks about it for two minutes and then gives you uh, <laughs> an opinion and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's it's not good at all right um i think it's one of the things that's fortunate that that you know he's a, a very the position that he has is very fortunate with the network that he, you know and the deal that that I, I know he has because they he i don't think they work to a great schedule i'm good friends with peter clifford and um uh, Danny Garcia. Yeah. And you know, Lisa, Danny lives here in Houston. Yeah. Lisa De La Vega, the, yep. some mm-hmm. of my best friends yeah. the, uh, and, in Magic and, and really lovely people. And I think that they don't, they don't have a real hard time scale to when they have to deliver it. That's true. Which, which most TV shows absolutely. Very tight. You know, yeah. Because um, they got a certain budget and you got to get it within that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so from that point of view, he really is in a position to, 
to be able to come up with the best product that he possibly mm-hmm. can. Mm-hmm. And and it shows because I think his his certainly the last T V shows that he's done were extraordinarily good. Have there been some escapes and Jonathan that you have done once and swore to never do again? Um uh, maybe I there's certainly there's certainly one that I've done twice and would never do again. Okay. Uh, I did um I have twice done an escape where I was covered in in bees. Um, okay. Uh the first time was about 50,000 bees in the second. Now how do they do that? Did they cover you with honey first or something or Well, the the it was a, the second time was probably the most, the first time they literally just dumped them on me. Okay. Um, and the second time I worked with a guy I don't know whether he's still alive. He was quite elderly when I did this, and it would have been in about 2006. In the UK? In the States. Oh, States. Um, yeah, I made a series for Discovery Channel called One Way Out, um, and it was about the science of, of escapology. Hmm. And, um, we, it wasn't exposing things, I guess. No, it was, about, um, it was really about the science of, of jeopardies. Um, oh, okay, and I would talk. You know, there wasn't because everything I was doing was real. There, there, there's no, there was. I would talk a little bit about how you might pick open a lock or or, or something like that. But we didn't really get into that stuff mm-hmm. primarily because it's not that interesting. You know, the interesting mm-hmm. stuff is is the dangerous side of it. Mm-hmm. You know? um, and we would do a lot of of testing um, uh, and, and experiments, and then we would do whatever the stunt was, and so. Um, the, the thing we were investigating in in that episode of the show was that it was minimal movement because usually if you're escaping from something, you need to move very vigorously in Makes order, to, in order to, to get out. Mm-hmm. And, but what I, I posed the, the, the question, what would happen if the situation you were in, that moving was really bad, you know, then, ha- you, then how do you get out? Yeah, when you have bees all over you. Exactly. So... I uh, I was covered in 200,000 bees and uh, standing on a washing machine. I was in a box, but on a washing machine. And um, uh, it was set to 30 seconds before spin cycle. Mm. So I had to escape before the whole thing got shaken very violently. And these bees were attached? They were literally on, no, they were literally on me. Yeah. So so Norman Gary, who was the... the um, the the bee expert he was in, and for the longest time he was the guy to go to uh, in Hollywood for bees. Wow. He, okay. He, he killed Macaulay Culkin in My Girl with 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 bees. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> Not literally, but, but yeah. No, he he <laughs> had he was the person that had isolated the pheromone um, that uh, the queen emits, hmm. and so he had a little vial of it, and I wore basically like a giant stocking. And they've been soaked the, in that thermal. The, he just put tiny little dabs oh. of it all over me, and then he would throw them in the air. He'd get like a scoop, like you'd see in a grocery store yeah. or something, and of bees, and throw them in the air, and they would just come and land on me. It took a long time; it took a, probably about an hour f- to get covered. And Talk I just about had, standing for a long time, and still. you're waiting for bees to come and light on you. Yeah, goodness. Uh, until I was completely covered, head to toe. Um, uh, and uh, okay, and standing on a washing machine. Standing on a washing machine, and then we did it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I was stung about. I was stung about thirty times, and mm. went into uh, toxic shock afterwards, um, uh, because you just can't process that amount of. of so, what were you trying to escape from? You were trying to. So I was. I was. I had to. I was tied up. My wrists oh. were tied together. Okay. in the box. And then I had to to get out of the box as well. The box was locked. Um, so. In uh, with the bees on you in the box, locked and on top, and the box was on top of the uh, sewing machine, built so, onto the top. Onto okay, the top so you weren't standing machine. on top of the machine. You were in no. The box. I was standing on top of. I was standing on the washing machine. The box was on top of the washing machine, and I'm inside the box. Inside, I got you now. I'm yeah. with you. I, I visualize. Okay. okay. So you got out of that with only thirty stings. I got thirty stings and. Uh, yeah, it was it only it golly. was it was a lot, and um, the reason that I did it again was because when I had done it with fifty thousand, it didn't look right. It didn't look 
when they dumped them on you, you mean? Yeah, it didn't look how I wanted it to look. Mm -hmm. And so then we did it again for One Way Out, and it was exactly right. It's exactly what I visualized. So I've done it, been there, not doing one back. (laughs) It really sucks. What about the shark thing? I would think that'd be another thing that I don't know that I want to go and try again. No, that that I would do all day long. I'm I'm a water person, so I love all of that stuff. And we did... um, uh, that was actually uh, wasn't an escape. It was uh, a Shark Week special. Okay, uh, I I made a, a Shark Week special called "How Not to Become Shark Bait," Meet. and okay. we looked at what are statistically the five stupidest things to do in shark infested water. And, and that then, would be um, uh, swimming at dawn and dusk, um, wearing high contrast colors, um, spear fishing is another is another good one splashing at the surface and there was another one I, I mm. it's a long time ago I remember I, um, the, the one that worked actually mm-hmm. um, was was high contrast colors um, mm-hmm. it's the same science as a fishing lure you know a shark is, is attracted to that naturally attracted to something that looks interesting mm-hmm. shiny and, object yeah and, and um, even though I mean, there was a Caribbean reef shark that that, that bit me um, on your leg on or? my leg yeah mm. that I you know if they're going to come and investigate they don't have hands that they can look at something oh, so they're going to use their mouths mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it wasn't necessary it was just seeing what I was um, and I was wearing chain mail I was dressed as a clown is what is okay. what they had me do the big um, contrasting colors certainly. yeah and um, and it, it came in the thing that happens though uh, when you're wearing chain mail is the uh, uh, sharks have serrations on their teeth mm-hmm. uh, uh, and so they when, get stuck in the chain yeah the bite of the shark isn't her it wasn't horrendous I, i've been bitten by an attack dog for another thing a, a german shepherd has a way more powerful bite actually hmm. but what they do is they they use their teeth like we would use a fork so they they hold the prey Mm-hmm. And then they anchor their body in the water, and they thrash side to side, and that oh. that the, the serrations of their teeth saw through whatever it is they're holding on to. Like they're carving into it. Yeah, exactly. And then they get a mouthful. Well, when you're wearing chainmail, you're entirely right. The the serrations get caught in the links of the chain, and mm-hmm. you end up with a shark attached to you. But they can't um, get loose. Yeah, it's so, even worse. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you have to. It's sort of counterintuitive. You have to kind of hug them and, and uh-huh. like help it off. Huh. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting experience. I would do that that again. I, w- I really want to do uh, a great white thing. Actually, um, that's one of one of the things on my list. Now, when we first started talking about the illusionist and about how it's different and trying to create then a persona and, and a person that people care about, that I recall it used to be like Kevin would be the inventor, and I think Adam Trent was. I, I don't know. Everybody had like the something that they were, and so you know, it would seem that you could have that an escapologist interchange with another escapologist instead of Jonathan Goodwin. Or, but what you're saying now is that they really have characters that are you, and people care about Jonathan, not just an escapologist. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And I think that certainly there is a level of, of interchangeability within, within the product, you know, within the show, so that you know you can go and see there are other versions of this show there's usually about three versions of it touring the world right now mm-hmm. um, isn't charlie fry with the, like they stood in the 1905 or whatever no that because david was with that too i I, and I was actually in the original cast of that show um the so david does the circus version so david is the mm-hmm. ringmaster of circus 1903 is that still um, touring? It does, yeah. Okay. The magic show uh, was wonderful, and I, in my opinion, was maybe the best version of the Illusionists from the point of view of a of a, of a theatrical magic show that, mm-hmm. that they've done. But um, it was it would have been a very expensive show to tour. I we took it to Broadway. I, I played the yeah. um, Broadway. Uh, one of the main reasons is the cast of that show uh, um, it, is just. To, you know, it was just very, very difficult to get to 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 tour together because everybody's so busy. You know, Charlie, their own and, thing. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie and Sherry is the you know two of right. the, the the busiest working professionals. You know, I think in, Charlie's in a new Johnny Thompson. You know, I mean, he just knows a little bit of everything about everything. Charlie is obnoxious. He is <laughs> Charlie is is he is the most 
most talented human being I think I've ever yeah. met. Yeah. He could do any of our acts mm. and better than us. He's just, he, he's a renaissance man, actually, Charlie yeah. Fry. I love him dearly. Yeah. He, they're, they're, they're very, very wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's, you know, they're, they're, they're all saying they're retiring. I'll like to see it when it happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, uh, Brian he, Thompson retired too. Yeah. <laughs> Not until he died. <laughs> they're, they're constantly working, you know. Rick and Tara, uh, uh, Rick, Thomas, have an amazing uh residency in, mm -hmm. in branson. branson and yeah. so they're doing that show they just have a, had a little baby i've got a framed poster in my office of him he's wonderful yeah great he's guy such a great performer but this is one of the great things about doing the the 1903 shows that we we would do a thing in the middle of the show where we would all be on stage together and we would all have audience members with us and we would all do a little something. We call it the parlor. At the same time? So or, it's kind of like a ring, a uh, different three-ring circus going on kind of no, thing? No, we took it in turns. Oh, okay, gotcha. But we were all on stage while we took it in turns. I see. And um, I, you just sit, I just got to sit and watch Rick Thomas every day do, yeah. do his, his watch routine, which mm -hmm. is just a master class. It was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. they're, they're fabulous. And, um, and then also we had Tommy um, and Amelie in that show. Mm -hmm. uh, who are, you know, sought after or around the world. So the idea of now trying to put that show back together again is almost It'd be impossible, impossible because that everyone's successful in their own careers and exactly. on their own tours. I mean, I just saw, you know, Tommy and Emily over in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and just a few months ago, yeah. you know, and they were on the way to New Orleans. I mean, they're just all over the place. All over the world. The world so, yeah. so, um, so it was a great show, but, but that one's, I think, probably seen its last... Uh, performance, which is a mm. shame, but uh, I'm, I was I was yeah. glad to have been involved in it. Yeah, that is great. That's great. Well, uh, so this particular tour, are you in the middle, the beginning? Where are you approximately? We're, we are um, maybe coming up to the last, the beginning of the last third. We are over. We're over halfway. And will you take a break and then come back then again in the fall? Or uh, yes, I mean I think so. That's kind um, of plan. There, there is. Um, you know, the, it usually it usually sort of gears up, um, and and maybe we'll go away and do a, d a different version or other things in the summer. Last year, I was in the West End with the show in the summer, mm -hmm. with this um, show with the with illusion, the, with the illusion same guys? in the summer. It wasn't same? the same guys. Oh, it wasn't completely okay. completely different cast. Yeah, and then um, well, there was another touring illusion show. Uh, Faye Presto was involved with for a while in the UK. Champions of Magic. Champions of Magic. Yeah, it was is produced by a friend of mine called Alex Jarrett. Um, and they're doing really great things. They're they, still touring they, too. They, they are okay. still touring, actually. Yeah, um, and uh, and that's a fun little show. But that's actually. just in the UK. Are they or are they going? No, they they Europe, they are they're actually predominantly in America. They're, oh, really? They're traveling across I've not the seen states there. Okay. too. Yeah, um, I know. Um, very recently, they were up in in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a great show. I don't think Faye is in the in the show no, anymore. She left some time ago. Um, but. Uh, and I haven't seen it for a little while, but I'm I'm friends with the with the cast of that show, and they're they're all good good guys. Mm -hmm. And so during the time that you're off, do you have other things that you do, or you have like your own little tour? I say little, you know, <laughs> and going out and and doing something, or, do. or do you just kind of come up with some other ideas, or go back to work on TV? I, I do all sorts of different things. Um, it is that's one of the things that I love about about my life. Really, is that it's forever variable. So, you know, I. I, I might go and work a little bit in television. Um, I uh, a year ago or two years ago, I guess it was now, I was asked to go and create all of the finale stunts for Drummond uh, Money Coots's oh, Netflix that's right. special. Yes. So I and I wasn't involved in the shoot at all, but I I wasn't wild about that. No, I I haven't actually personally. I haven't seen it. And I think it was a bit of a, I, I, it was a bit of a. Um, it's kind of slow, I thought. Yeah, it was a bit, and it was a, a bit of a, an odd concept. Um, you know, when when they called me up about it and said, you know, we're going to do, you know, magic tricks that have killed people, <laughs> and and Drummond's a nice guy, but he's a he's not a stunt performer. He's a he's a close up close up guy, right? Magician. And so he was very much out of his element in, in a lot of that stuff. And but I was also to, wondering what you were saying about that the producer may have come in and said, here's what I want. And so they may have had some plans which might have been different because I said it, 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 there was something. It was, it was just, a real, it was a very mixed bag. There were lots of cooks in the kitchen. That's what I thought. 
and um and at the same time when i when i first went in and i spoke to them about it i was like well this is maybe a bit of a foolish commission mm. because they were struggling to come up with eight in season one mm. and so if you if you can't come up with eight in season one you're not having season two season two is <laughs> going to be a real stretch yeah um and uh and i think that was borne out really um i think i think it may have been a lesson in you know in sticking to, to mm -hmm. the things that that you know that you that, that speak to you most right um uh and you know like i said he's a very charming and very talented close-up magician mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. maybe that's the sort of the the direction that there's perhaps most fitting for me. So what do you see yourself doing in the next five years? Continuing to tour? You got some other ideas? I mean, you're a young man. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I'm, I think I'm going to do the America's Got Talent show this year. Um, okay, good uh, luck. I, I, thank you. Penn and Teller Foolish, maybe? Doing something like that, too? Possibly. I mean, I'm not really... That's the thing about what I do, is that I'm not really trying to fool anybody. Mm. Um, but um, I, I'm, I'm certainly going to do the... the I, I, ADT. I didn't expect to enjoy Britain's Got Talent, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I, I. Um, what was that? I mean, what was the experience that made it? Just the people you work with, the producers, the people backstage, all the, of it, the fun of all of it. And and you know, I've done I've done quite a lot of television shows. Yeah. And and my experience up until that point had been doing other people's television shows is very very difficult and mm -hmm. usually quite unpleasant mm -hmm. because it, the agenda is all about them. And you are a cog in a wheel, and quite often, you know, it, they, those those shows like talk shows. I've done, you know, Jimmy Kimmel and Jonathan Ross in the UK, and Rachel Ray, and they're, they're real machines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and quite often, it's hard. It, it, the, you know, the the priority is never you and what you're doing. It's always about the show the and the host yeah and so to go in and get those things how you want them and to portray for them to portray what you're doing in its best light is very difficult very stressful and it's possible and you know it's something that i've done a bunch of but it's not pleasant yeah whereas the bgt show actually they were everybody was charming they were super respectful they wanted it to be how i wanted it to be and um so they made it more about you rather than about simon and yeah and not necessarily obviously you know the star of that show is simon cowell and, and, mm -hmm. the, and the you know and the, ho and the, the, judges. And the judges and that's fine but from the point of view of the process of it it was it was really nice they were great to work with very mm -hmm. collaborative and they wanted they just trusted me you know they, it was very clear to me that the, from the very beginning that they that they had a, re a level of respect for, for me and what I do. To having, let you do what you wanted to do. they kind of let, let me do what I wanted to do. Did yeah. you get on because you had approached them, or have you got an agent that contacted them, or how did that uh, um, come about? I'm not supposed to say this, but they <laughs> they had asked me to go on it every year for 10 years, and I'd always said no. I'd gotten um, phone calls you know, here in the U.S. Sure. also for AGT. It's like, hey, we're going to be in Dallas or San Antonio. So I, I, in my case, I don't have an end game. I don't sure. have a theater show that I want to put butts in the seats. I'm yeah. not working in Vegas, and so I, you know, and I don't need a reel. And I'm getting older. It's kind of sure. like, so I've just never just said no. no thank course. you. <laughs> yeah, you have to go into it with an agenda. Yeah, and and I and I kind of had an agenda, a reason for, that I wanted to do it. We were doing the the I said I said we were doing the 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 show in in the West End, mm -hmm. uh, in the the Illusionist show, and so it. For me, it was a um, it was a twofer. Really, it was it was, you know, have have an experience and and get some some good footage, right. and then also get some good promo for the for the theatre show. Sure, you know, that we were going to do. Yeah, um, and and that was it, really, because I I don't I I don't live in the UK anymore. I live in Las Vegas, and okay. so um, that was sort of a closed agenda for for me. But the states, I don't really have a big profile here nobody really knows who i am yeah uh, uh, and totally so, listen to this podcast <laughs> yeah well exactly so um so that's kind of it you know that the, you know do do that show and see and see what comes of it i i love being in the illusionists but i live my life on stage in periods of eight minutes and mm -hmm. i would like to do something a little more 
you know something that's longer and something that is um, my show. Um, yeah, I understand. And uh, and if it gives me the opportunity to do that, would be great. And the other thing that I would like to do, um, and this is, you know, maybe a separate or 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 joined goal, is work from home. You know, I've I've been touring with mm-hmm. this show for six years, and um, you nice to have your own show in Vegas, so you just don't have to go any place. I want to be able to. I want to be able to commute to work. Yeah, you know? be like Matt King. Exactly. <laughs> Everybody wants to be like Matt King. Doesn't everybody? Goodness, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In so many ways. Well, listen, as we start to wrap up, first of all, let me thank you again for your time. And it's oh, been pleasure. delightful. I've just uh, loved everything you had to say. I'm just, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm on um, the tip of the spear, you know, <laughs> so, uh-huh. to just in, in the anticipation of everything you're going to be saying. It's very, very interesting. But the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word, and I always like to close by asking the guests, what is it that's your philosophy of life? What is it that's your, I say magic word, but it could be, what is your chi? You know, when you wake up in the morning, what is it that drives you not a word it could be a phrase a a philosophy of life oh i i I mean i have um it's funny that you say that actually because i just uh i've in the last uh couple of months i last probably three months i i have got two tattoos okay (laughs) <laughs> that I, and I'd never had had them before. It's never been a thing that was was interesting to me. But I kind of shifted my opinion. And so on my right arm, I have a Latin phrase that says "sinumetu," which is without fear. And then um, I just turned forty in mm-hmm. February, mm-hmm. and on my fortieth birthday, I got this tattooed on my arm, which is holy cow, <laughs> uh, which is a, a quote uh, that says. Uh, So I struggled and fought. I have done and abstained. I have tortured my body and risked my life, only for that to have one plank on the stage where they must fall back and cry master. Harry Houdini. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, maybe more than you were asking me for. But but I think that's that's kind of it, is I love what I do, and I love um, coming up with new and crazy ideas. I I try and put in my in my show... In every everything I do, I try and put in um, uh, a moment that I call the O oh, expletive yes. moment, mm-hmm. uh, where you know I'm explaining something, the audience is going along for the ride, but I leave one piece of information out until the very last moment, and just before we go. I let them have that last piece of information. And now the whole thing makes sense. Then it all comes together. And the audience go, oh, no. They don't say, oh, no, but yeah. you, you get the point. <laughs> um, and for me, that's what it's about. It's about creating that moment for an audience. So, Got it. So create that uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> moment yeah. for the audience. Thank you very much, Jonathan. A pleasure. It's been fantastic. Thanks so for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Jonathan Goodwin. And this is Scotty L. Well, that was a good one, actually, Jonathan Goodwin. And I thank you, Jonathan, for being my guest this week and for taking some time to uh, chat with us here in your dressing room. And that was just fantastic. I know that you had other things on your mind to prepare for later for the evening show. And I know how much this really means to the rest of the listeners also to hear these kinds of stories that you shared. And they were pretty phenomenal. This was really, really enlightening to me. And I hope to a lot of you listeners as well well and that you've enjoyed this as much as I did getting to uh, meet and chat with uh, my new friend Jonathan Goodwin so if you ever get a chance to see him whether it's going to be on television or in a live performance please go out of your way and make some time uh, to watch this uh, incredible performer wow I always got a lot of really good ideas and uh, he's, he's got some good things in here that he talked about I think too that can apply towards uh, your performance and as, as well so anyhow thanks again Jonathan this was great well listen I want to wrap up and again thank our sponsor themagicbookshop.com and remind everybody that we are going to have another week on the contest we've been running a contest for $100 of free books compliments of Eric Citron who is the owner and proprietor of themagicbookshop.com and he is going to send you $100 worth of magic books $100 of his choice retail value and if you live in the U.S. the shipping will be free if you're living outside the U.S. then he'll calculate the form 
long-term postage, and if you're willing to pay for that postage, then he will send that to you. If not, then we'll draw then a, an alternate name. So again, you have one more week to sign up for this contest. It's been running for the last couple weeks, and we have uh, uh, quite a few contestants who have uh, registered so far, have thrown their names in the hat, so to speak. If you'll just go to themagicwordpodcast.com, there at the bottom of this week's blog and the last two weeks' blogs, actually, there is a registration form where that you can enter for a chance to win $100 of books, of uh, magic books, compliments of the magicbookshop.com. Also, that I want to remind you that there is a 15% promo code that if you put in magic word when you check out that you'll get 15% off of all of your purchases. Uh, He always throws in an extra magic book. Whenever you order something, he'll throw in something else for free. Plus, you get the 15% uh, for listening to the podcast. So again, just put in magic word and get something kind of cool. So listen, thank you guys very much for listening here this week. And one last thing, I want to encourage you to go to the website, to the magicwordpodcast.com, where you always get additional content, and in particular, towards the end of this conversation, that he talks about the tattoos that he has on his arm, and I show you a close-up of that that is kind of uh, interesting to uh, see. And so, it's worth looking at, so uh, go take a peek. Until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to give your audiences that aha, uh-huh, or oh what the heck happened there (laughs) kind of experience this is Scotty out